sharing the, the final of the series entitled Stay Salt. And it's been a fabulous series and uh, it's been dear to all of our hearts as pastors and leaders that it's been a timely series. And the book by Rebecca uh, Pippett, and many of you have purchased these, in fact, we've run out, uh, but I would recommend that you get a copy and read it. Uh, I've read it through, I've got maybe two chapters to go in the earlier chapters, but I'm gonna read it again and note it because her stories are impacting and the key principles are so simple. And uh, we are, um, if you would like a copy, we, you can let us know on your Connect card and we can order one and uh, for you. Um, but it is fantastic. In fact, it, it's so good. She has other resources that we, in all of our four congregations, uh, we wanna mine and look at some of the resources and implement them for the next year. Uh, in our faith goals that we have set, um, we, we really see the need to, 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 for many more people to come to Christ. And that just doesn't happen by us wishing it uh, or even just praying for it to come. You know, we can pray, oh God, save people and bring them in. But the way God works is he works through you and me. And 98% of people come to faith because somebody, somebody talked to them. A friend, a family member, a work associate. Somebody has built a relationship with them and, and opportunities arisen where they can share their, their, their life story, their faith story. And, and then the invitation to come to church is easy because it's built out of a relationship of trust where the person knows that person. And so Rebecca, um, she wrote the book Out of the Salt Shaker, which we read in the 1970s. And it was probably the most impactful book on evangelism uh, that affected the Christian church uh, right around the world. And uh, now she's a, a much older woman, but she's been a top evangelist, but a real thinking, smart, savvy, a person who knows how, how to empower churches and groups, universities, uh, Christian groups, to present the gospel. And so some of her resources are fantastic and we're gonna mine some of those for next year. So get ready. So uh, I encourage you, get the book and read it because it'll help enliven your faith. So my message today is kind of a summary and an encouragement. To stay salt, to stay salt, we trust Jesus' word, we depend on Jesus' spirit, we invite people to consider Jesus and we connect those folks within his church, his church of love and, and, and faith and hope. So we connect with Jesus' people. Now the Apostle Paul said it so beautifully to the Thessalonian Christians. So, so he, he says, his words help us to focus on the word the Holy Spirit and a community of love, which was the Thessalonian Christians there in Northern Greece. Look at these words that he writes. He says, for when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. We weren't on our own. We gave the word, but the Holy Spirit was there and he reinforced that word, that gospel message about the person of Jesus into your lives and brought salvation for you. And you know of our concern for you. This is love, because we loved you. We set up this church, this community of love in Thessalonica and, and the message has gone from you and you've seen the way we lived when we were with you. As a result, you have become an example of this new church to all the believers in Greece, Northern Greece and Southern Greece, Macedonia and Achaia. So several things I wanna affirm today. One is we have irresistible power in our message about Jesus when we faithfully share about Him. When Paul was in the Mamertine prison in, in Rome, he wrote to Timothy, and it's a great little statement. So he's a prisoner, he is chained. This is before he's executed under that rogue emperor, Nero. He was in house arrest for two and a half years. He was released, he went out and pioneered in Crete and probably went to Spain for another couple of years. Then around 66, 67 AD, we don't know, they whacked him in the Mamertine prison and beheaded him during one of the purges of Christians in Rome. 
And before he dies, he writes to Timothy, to Timothy's a magnificent letter to his son in the faith. And, uh, and he says this to him, and I love this. And because I preach this good news, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal. But then he, then he says to Timothy, but the word of God cannot be chained. He says, I'm changed physically, but the word of God that's in my heart, I don't have a Bible to read, I don't have the letters to read, but the word of God that's in my heart is coming out. And you know what? He led his jailers to Christ. At the end of Philippians, he says, I salute you. This is the, one of the final letters, Philippians and 2 Timothy. He says, I salute you and those of Caesar's household. So as he's chained to these Praetorian guards, Caesar's personal bodyguard, his, who is the prisoner really? They're his prisoner. The Word of God cannot be chained. He is physically chained, but the Word of God is cut loose and he's able to share and testify and he led a whole stack of those cops to Christ and they became evangelists in the kingdom, expanding the kingdom of God throughout the Roman Empire because the Praetorian Guard would go all over the empire. They were the emperor's secret police. They would spy on the politicians and the governors to make sure they're on. So wherever they went, they shared the gospel. And so Paul led many of them to Christ. And he says to the Philippians, those in Caesar's household, they salute you as well, those who are of the faith. So the word of God cannot be chained. The word that's in you needs to come out of you. What you know about Jesus, what he's done for you, your experience of him. Our world is desperate to hear. Your world, the people in your world need to hear. And not just to hear, but to actually see it lived out through your life. That they would say, wow, what, what is it that's different about you? Isaiah wrote the following words about the germinating and life-giving power of God's word. I love this. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Isn't that a great scripture? Yes. Wonderful. Just a few weeks ago, a man visited one of our services. And as he was sitting there, he was, I saw him and and our eyes caught and, and I went up to him during the, the greeting time and, uh, and he says, uh, do you remember me? And I said, well, um, well, not really. <laughs> I said, but the face is a little bit familiar and he told me his story. Back in the mid 1980s, he was here at church as a little boy. He becomes a ward of the state and uh, comes from a chaotic and dysfunctional family. And uh, his journey, terrible journey. I won't go into the details, just a, a shocker of a story. He ended up in prison, drugs, alcohol. Uh, but now he's, he's come to Christ and he's in one of our CRC churches in the country. And he said, I want to come and, and, and see you. I want to come to, to visit. And, uh, and I just said to him, I said, well, how did the church impact you back then? And, and he made the comment, he said, he goes, it was very good. He ended up staying in one of our homes and the people looked after him. I said, how was that experience? Because it was good. So here's this little boy, comes from a chaotic family. The state has to take him off his family. Goes from place to place, comes into the life of the church. We haven't seen him in 30 years, but the seed of the Word of God that came into his heart has germinated. And the thing I want to know was, did we do a good job? Did we live it? Did we, what, what's the vibe that you picked up? He says, it was good. And I was just, I went home to Catholic, that's made my week. That's the best thing that's happened to me all week to hear of a man now in, in probably late 40s, early 50s, as a little boy, we're able to impact him. Friday night, I was with uh, youth and uh, in the shed. We had our largest number. It was the, it was the final night for uh, Nick. Are you around Nick? You're somewhere. And, um, and so Nick, we were gonna farewell him on the 18th of December. And uh, what they did to Nick is almost sinful. I'm at the back, they've got pies, they're, pie, they're paying him out for leaving us. They go, I'm gonna get you. And uh, uh, no, all in love, of course, they just blessed him. And, um, and we acknowledge that, that God is calling Nicky uh, to serve in another local church uh, on the other side of the, the city. But he's done a great job and, and uh, uh, the youth were terrific. And I just saw a bunch of young people at the back 
having their own meeting while the meeting was going on, you know, on their phones and, and, and I'm thinking, isn't somebody gonna go and speak to them and say, come on you guys, go and sit up the front and pay attention. There was a couple of other boys just roaming around and sort of just cruising and, 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 I, and I thought, these kids come from dysfunctional families. They come from broken homes. I noticed the leaders every so often would go up and sit next to one or two and just put their arms around them. And and I thought, you know what? These kids have come, I'd sooner have them come there and not be on the streets. And at least they can hear the gospel being shared. And also that somebody is loving on them. You know, and just a, a, a holy touch and an embrace to say, we love you, we esteem you, we, we honour you and uh, keep coming back. And I thought, man, you know, there are some of the, the principals and, and teachers tell me that there are schools in South Australia or Australia where not one child comes from an intact family. Yeah. I can't believe that. I thought, wow, that's, you know, fractured families and, uh, uh, and kids that are, don't have good role models uh, in their mums and dads and sometimes the state has to take them and, and uh, they've got to be fostered out or, or whatever. And so, um, and I shared with um, a couple of the kids from, the leaders from, uh, oh, here he is, the Wabnitz boy. Friday night was the final night of breakout and I saw him leaving with Alicia and I said, Sam, how was it? And he was tuckered out. I said, rough night, yeah. And, uh, and they've, got, they've got their hands full with some of the kids that come in. But I tell you what, we love those kids, we reach out to them, and you never know, guys, that a story like the one I've shared with, that 30 years later, 35 years later, they come back and say, the seed of the Word of God that was sown in their hearts about Jesus and the demonstration of love by a leader can be just the thing that will bring them through. And so what you do, for our breakout kids on Friday night and what, what uh, Nick and, and Rachel and the team do on Friday night with youth is fantastic. And I honour you all, it was great to be there. And, uh, and I just thank God that I was no longer a youth leader so I wouldn't be pied and, <laughs> and they'd do other indecent things to you. So we have irresistible power in our message about Jesus when we faithfully share about him. Secondly, we have the limitless power of the Spirit's presence working miraculously through our witness about Jesus. We are not on our own. This is not just word power. This is not just we trying to to win our friends and family members. The Holy Spirit loves them more than you. The Holy Spirit is working on their hearts. He is preparing people. I'm amazed sometimes when I hear this stuff, I think God's been working both ends. He's not just working through me. He's actually working there and preparing people to receive the message. His presence makes all the difference. Jesus gave this promise to his followers back then and it, it, it's valid for us today. He says, but you will receive power, spiritual anointing, energy, divine power, supernatural dynamite when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. You cannot witness without the Holy Spirit's help. You can't be an effective witness without the Holy Spirit's help. And that's why praying for your family members and friends, you may not know what to say, but the people that you work with or go to school with or in your neighbours, pray for them. And the Holy Spirit will do His work. We just have to be listening. We've got to be open for business and be listening to, the, to his promptings of how he leads us and guides us. And that's why when we set up our faith goals for the next two years, we never even knew this book was out. But we made the comment that we need to see a lot more people come to Christ. And then Pippet wrote her second book and, we thought, and she's got resources that we think, you know what, we need, we need something like this to help us all on our journey of leading people to Jesus and being more effective personal witnesses and collective uh, witnesses as a church. The Apostle Peter said in one of his messages in the book of Acts, he said this, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead. He's speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees. After you killed him by hanging him on a cross. That is, he says, resurrection, death, resurrection of Christ, the essence of, of the good news. Then God put him in the place of honour at his right hand. He's risen and he's sovereign as prince and saviour. 
He did this so the people of Israel, and we are the spiritual Israel today, would repent of their sins. So when they would see the crucified Saviour, when they would acknowledge that he's risen from the dead and he's alive, that they would change their mindset. That's what repentance means. The Greek word metanoia means I just change my thinking patterns. I, I, I just admit that I'm wrong and that God is right and I'm shifting my thinking to say, you know what, I wanna get on God's side. And when you repent and you face up to saying, I am wrong, God is right. Forgive me, Lord, of all my sins. Forgiveness comes, salvation comes. The gift of eternal life comes into a person's life. And he says here, so he did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things, Peter said, and notice it, and so is the Holy Spirit. He is the biggest witness. And so you cannot witness without him. You might think you're on your own, but you're not. He is doing his work. And sometimes you think you're just sowing seeds. You don't know where those seeds are gonna go, but you've got to believe as you pray for people, as you depend upon the Holy Spirit, he will do his amazing, amazing work. Amazing work, what he does. The Spirit of God, and Rebecca Pippett makes this comment, it's a quote from her book, page 219. I love this. She says, the Spirit of God works through the Word of God to reveal the Son of God. Isn't that good? The Spirit of God works through the Word of God to reveal the Son of God. The Spirit of God makes Jesus come alive to people as they reflect on who Jesus is. Thirdly, we have the immense privilege to encourage the people we have a trusting relationship with. They're the key words, trusting relationship with, to take a deeper look at Jesus. And you can do that. The person who got it rolling for me was my dear friend who I grew up with, primary school and high school. I knew him, he knew me. We were buddies together. We were partners in crime. Uh, We caused difficulties in our high school. I mean like the ethnic kids, we ran the school. They had the prefects and head prefects, but that didn't mean anything. We ran the school. And, uh, and so we, we just, we, we gave the teachers and the, and the administration heartache. I still remember the day that I went to the principal's office and I said, Mr. Miller, Mr. Miller, I said, we want to set up a smoking room. He goes, what do you mean? Well, we can smoke at recess time and lunchtime. You can't do that, this is a school. Meanwhile, he's puffing away. You can't smoke, this is a school. And then, but, but my parents had given me permission. I smoke in front of them at home. I was only 15, 16. I started smoking when I was 11 years of age. My mum and dad, mum was a notorious smoker. Dad, you know, so they weren't a good example in that area. So we picked up and then mum used to steal my cigarettes and we used to have arguments. And, and uh, so I said to him, look, I said, my parents, I'll, I'll get written permission. And every argument he raised, I said, but it's not right. You can smoke, why can't we smoke? We've got permission, we'll do it in, in a classroom. At the end, he's, get out of here, Vassala, because it's not going to happen. And so my friend and I, we were the wild ones. We were known. And anyway, one, one day, after, this is 1971, after Easter, he comes to school, he's walking across the Asheville. I look at him, he looks different. I looked at him, I said, what's up with him? He looked like there was a light on top of him and like he was glowing. And he comes up and I said, um, What's up with you? you? You look different. He goes, do I? Yeah. What's happened to him? I just knew something had happened to him. And, and, and he was so, he just said, oh, Bill, I, guess I, I can't really explain it. I went to this camp, this Easter camp, a Pentecostal youth group Easter camp. And he'd gone to the church, he was invited to go the week before, they got him into the camp. Well, he got saved, baptised in the Holy Spirit, delivered, all kinds of stuff. The power of God was on him. So he, he, he came back and he didn't know exactly what had happened, except that, and I said, what's happened? He goes, oh, Bill, he goes, I've come to know God. I said, you know God? Yeah, yeah, I know God. I'm like, oh no, no, what's happened to him? And I'm saying, what do you mean? He goes, okay, because I've got, I've got this personal relationship with Jesus. And I'm thinking, Jesus is dead. What do you? And, and I said, what has happened to you? Explain to me. And he tried to explain the gospel. He really couldn't. He just had an experience. So he just said, you've got to come and see. Just, just come and see. So I went to a Sunday night meeting like this. 
in the week after Easter 1971 and I've never stopped coming to meetings like this. I found Jesus there, a bunch of new friends, the presence and power of God, the message of the gospel. And uh, um, he didn't explain the gospel. He just encouraged me to take a deeper look at Jesus. He said, I've got a relationship with him. I thought he was nuts until I started, then I started reading the New Testament for myself. See, the Apostle Peter insightfully writes on how to be a credible witness about Jesus. I love what Peter says in 1 Peter 3. You wanna be a credible witness? He says this, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. In other words, just be committed. Make sure Jesus is at the very centre of your life. Don't, don't, don't be a fake. Let Christ rule in you and through you. Be a genuine Christian. No, no, you're not perfect. If you sin, you've got to repent and be cleansed. And, and if you muck up, you've got to apologise. And, and we're not talking about perfection. We're talking about humility and reliance upon a living Christ. He says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. He's number one. And he goes, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And this is why we want to prepare you to, give, to help you with answers. We've got some fantastic resources that we're going to share next year with you. But do this with gentleness and respect. We don't Bible bash people. We do not chew their heads off. We don't present ourselves that we are better and superior. We are just one, one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. We found the bread of life, Jesus Christ. We, we discovered there's only one person who can, who can satisfy our thirst for meaning and, and reality, and that's Jesus. And so Peter says here, do it with gentleness and respect. And that means loving people. That means building relationship with people. That means being kind and generous so they can see that you're different, that you're a good person, that something has, has happened to you. And pray for them, that God will give you opportunities where you can actually share the reason that you have. And, and you, can, you, you all can actually share the gospel. You say, well, I don't know how to do it. Well, practice, that's why the book is helpful. I, I, I'd get a sheet of paper. You wanna know how to share your story? Just put down the first paragraph what you were BC. This is what I was. Don't go into all the gory details because we don't wanna know all about your sins. Just say, I was bad. I was naughty. How you met Christ. And then the second, the third paragraph, what a difference has he made to you? That's your story. And that, your story is absolutely unique. It is authoritative, it is powerful, it is meaningful to the people who know you, who know you that you've built relationship with, your story has got credibility with them. You go to a complete stranger that you don't know and you're not respectful and you're not gentle with them and try and, okay, who are you? I'm not listening to you. Why would they listen to you? Now, sometimes God can overrule that, but the people that know you and love you and work with you and live with you and they know you, when you know your story and you start praying for them and, 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 and you're living a life that is attractive, they may ask you or a, the conversation may arise where you're able to share your story, but you've got to know your story, what you were BC, how you met Jesus and, and uh, what a difference is made to your life. The Apostle Paul, um, his story. I mean, do you notice how many times in the book of Acts, Luke records that Paul shared his story? Yeah. I think it's three or four times, and also in uh, Galatians. So Paul's always, so I lined up the, the storytelling saying, is it the same, is he saying the same things? It's actually, he adds a little bit to it as well, you know, and, and, and he gives you the full picture, but he knew his story. He knew what had happened to him on the road to Damascus. He knew what he was BC. He knew how he met Christ and he knew what a difference Christ made to him. So when you read the end of the book of Acts, I didn't realise that Paul's arrest and first imprisonment in Caesarea, which is the, the Roman capital of the province of Judea, I thought it was just one chapter. Six chapters Luke spends on his arrest in Jerusalem. 40 men make a vow not to eat or drink until they kill him. So the Roman centurion, they were gonna tear him in peace because they hated him because he was a Christian. These are the religious nuts that were in Jerusalem. And so the, the Roman centurion got his men to lift him up and 
put him into, into the prison and they got hundreds of soldiers to take him up to Caesarea because Paul appealed and says, look, I'm a Roman citizen. He said, you are? We better treat you with respect. You can't beat a Roman citizen up. You can't torture them. You've got to treat them with respect. So even though he was a Jew, he was a Roman citizen, came through his parents. Hard to become a Roman citizen. So, so, so the centurion takes him up to Caesarea. Amazing story. I'd like to find out what happened to the 40 men who made a vow not to eat or drink until he was dead because he was in prison for two and a half years. So I reckon they died before him. <laughs> so he goes to prison and there's Governor Felix. For two years, he interrogates him. Every so often, Felix would get, uh, bring him out of prison, like to talk with him. Sort of like a house arrest, it, was, uh, it wasn't like a mammoth dungeon in Rome. And so Felix is the most witnessed, witnessed to man in the whole New Testament. Two years, he's got Paul sharing with him. And we don't, we don't know whether Felix gave his life to Christ, the governor, but he had to move on. A new governor comes called Festus. So he starts the process again. Paul is witnessing to the Roman governors the centurions, the bureaucracy in the capital of Caesarea for two and a half years. Who's in chains? They're chained to him. The word of God cannot be chained. And then, and then Festus says, look, you've made your appeal to, to Caesar because you're an innocent man. They, 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 they came up again with the new governor. They came up from Jerusalem saying, we want him. He's a bad man. We need, we need, he needs to be tried by our, our courts. And he says, no, you can't try him in your courts because he's a Roman citizen and he's appealed to Caesar. So he appealed, he appealed to Caesar, to Caesar he must go. So Festus said he's got to go to Rome. So before he, he goes on the ship to Rome, uh, King Agrippa comes in. King Agrippa was a young man and uh, a bit of a rat bag, sort of from the line of Herod and his wife, Bernice. And uh, so they wanted to check him out. So Festus says, oh, you've got to check out this guy. And uh, so Paul witnesses to the king and he shares with him, bold as brass, what an opportunity. And, and, and I've just got to read this scripture. Look at this interaction. He goes, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? Because Agrippa prided himself of knowing the Old Testament and knowing all about the Jewish religion. And, and Paul goes, I know you do. And Agrippa interrupts him and says, do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? Like he was really impacted. And Paul replied, whether quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everybody here in this audience might become the same as I am except for these chains. What a witness. How the Holy Spirit used him in spite of, of the darkness and difficulties of being in prison to share the gospel message to those far and wide and in this situation to those who were the, the political and economic and religious leaders of the province of Judea. Finally, we lovingly invite responsive people to come home to Jesus and to find a family, a new family in Jesus' church. You know, so often I hear the story when people come to Christ and they come into the life of the Christian Family Centre here, it's like, I feel like I'm, I'm home. It's like, I'm, I'm, this is like home. I feel like I'm, I'm back home. I heard that in Alice Springs with a couple of the Indigenous ladies who've come in in the last uh, 12 months. Uh, they said, this is home. It's like, I've just I've, I found a place. And it was just beautiful because they honoured Al and Jill saying, you know, we're loved and we're accepted and we, we have a place where we can serve other people. You believe in us. And the emotion was, I'm, I've come home. And then I get a call from uh, Sue um, Hargraves, John Gunther's wife in Darwin. She said, I've got to speak to you, I've got to speak to you. Please. So she said, a whole pile of new people have come into the church. And they're saying they've come home. So one couple who want to, want to serve, she said, I feel like this is home. What is that? People want fellowship, people want relationship. Look at what, um, what Luke says about the, the church in, in the book of Acts. And Luke makes it clear, this is normal for an on fire church. We are shaped folks for both spiritual and community life. There's a God shaped void in all of us that can only be filled by Jesus. And, and God designed us to have meaningful relationships and for us to experience deep friendships. And we're incomplete without being close to God and connecting to people with similar values. Luke expresses this in the first church, which is the model church. He says, all the believers devoted 
themselves or wholeheartedly committed themselves to the apostles' teaching. In other words, preaching and teaching and whether it's Sunday ministry or whether it's midweek and to fellowship, the life together, being connected to people and to sharing in meals like the Lord's Supper and to prayer. They worship together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. So non-Christians, those outside the faith, were looking in and saying, man, how they love each other. There's something different about them. And it says, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. That's an on fire church. That's my prayer for the Christian Family Centre. Has been for decades that uh, we reflect this. And folks, uh, we are shaped both for spiritual connection with God and for community relationship with one another. Uh, the world is very lonely. People are more lonely than ever today. And uh, um, people need a home. They don't realise out there in the community how valuable this church home is. If people out there knew what it was like here, they would rush here. Just that they're, they're, they're predisposed against thinking church is relevant. The devil blinds their eyes. That's why the only way is for us to share with them about Jesus and then they find Spirit, a spiritual home with him and a community home when they connect into, into church. And um, so I encourage you today to stay salt. Let's stand together. Let's close our eyes and, and pray. And uh, if you're online watching, you join us in prayer as well. To stay sold, as I've shared at the start of my message, we trust Jesus' word. We depend on Jesus' spirit. We invite people to consider Jesus. And we connect people into Jesus' church to be in relationship with people of similar faith and values. And folks, today, as we're standing in the Lord's presence and as you're with us online, Jesus walks towards us He's always walking towards us in His church. He is here. He says, wherever two or three people gather in my name, I am there with you through the Holy Spirit. And He loves us. He walks towards you today and He loves you in spite of your problems and, and sometimes the complex life issues that we, we face. Jesus wants to be deeply involved in our lives. And sometimes our lives are really messy. As we do life together with Him and with our brothers and sisters in His church. Father, I, I pray for every person here in this place and who's watching online. Help us, Lord, to stay salt. Help us to understand this at a profound level. Holy Spirit, do a work within our hearts. Free us, fire us up, Lord, to see that the church is the hope of the world because we steward the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And help us, Lord, to be the most loving, accepting, generous community possible. Help us, Lord, to attract people to the Jesus who lives within us. Give us opportunities to share our story, prepare our hearts, help us to build bridges with people that perhaps are acquaintances, but Lord, You want us to meaningfully connect with them. And as a relationship of trust develops, opportunities to share honestly will arise. So I pray, help us Lord, to live this life and to out.